Howdy campers! Counselor Foundflix here to welcome you to the best summer ever at Camp Arawak deep in the wilds of New Jersey. Sure, summer may be winding down, but the summer fun never stops at Camp Arawak. No matter what kind of fun you're looking for, we got it all at Camp Arawak. And me, along with our grisly old man owner Mel, will do nothing to make sure every kid has the most tubular time. The rest of our counselors and staff are absolutely top notch and have no concerning behaviors whatsoever. We got rid of that guy. Everyone is given rigorous personal training personally designed by Mel, and they are there to provide support and friendship to every camper at all times. Even if you are kind of a weirdo, you know, a little bit of a social outcast. What am I saying? It's the 80s. They're gonna get eaten alive. <laughs> Listen, activity-wise, it's nuts around here. I mean, you could do a different activity every day and not repeat the same activity. That's how many activities we got here. Volleyball, yay! Capture the flag. Baseball, home run. Canoes. Archery. Swing. Plus, we got motorboats for some high-speed fun out on the water. But do be aware, if you do decide to take one of our boats and use it, keep an eye out for others. This is serious. You could, you know, just totally lose control of the boat and then it just, bam, hits right into a family and kills them all. Causes irreparable damage that they are never able to overcome. 100% fun. Okay, yes, there have been some unsubstantiated rumors about a bunch of children being killed on the campgrounds. And I can promise you that's false. Most of the kids that drowned didn't even know how to swim, so that's on them, not me or Mel, and certainly not Camp Arawak LLC. So get your facts straight before you pass judgment. There weren't even that many murders in the first place. Get over it. Couple of dead kids, it's what happens at summer camp. <laughs> How's it going everyone? Welcome to Foundflix. In celebration of his 40th anniversary this year, we're taking a look back at the Sleepaway Camp series that burst onto the scene way back in 1983. Now it really wasn't well received at the time and mostly dismissed as a Friday the 13th knockoff. Honestly, that is fair criticism, but there is something special about Sleepaway Camp. The first one in particular. Over the years, it became more of a cult favorite. If nothing else, it is definitely remembered for its shocking twist ending. You might think like Friday the 13th that the Sleepaway Camp series went on to have a bunch of sequels, but that wasn't the case. A few years later, a new creative team followed up the original with the back-to-back -back sequels Unhappy Campers and Teenage Wasteland that were much sillier and over the top compared to its predecessor. As for what came next, things get really quite interesting with the sort of lost fourth entry, The Survivor. The footage was lost for several years until a dedicated fan managed to track it down and prove that it even existed in the first place. Finally, there was also Return to Sleepaway Camp, which features the return of the original writer and director of the first film. So we'll be taking a look at the entire series history, focusing mainly on the first Sleepaway Camp, but also covering each and every bit of the franchise. I'm a happy camper, let's do it. As Sleepaway Camp opens, we first see the infamous Camp Arawak after some kind of incident. The cabins and grounds are all empty now, hearing the creepy echoing laughter of children. On the front sign is a haphazard alert that the camp is now for sale. We then randomly jump back several years earlier, 1975, to a picture-perfect family day on the water. Peter bickers with his sibling, and John, their dad, tells him to cram it. Nearby on the water, some foolish kids are doing some boating. The siblings clutch to the sides of their boat, causing it to capsize, John cursing them as little schemers. They let Marianne drive the boat, urging her to not go too fast. On the shore, some guy calls out to John, his boyfriend, I guess, mentioning that Martha is coming, but not Ricky. The siblings innocently fry in the water, and the other boat starts getting perilously closer. The others scream for her to turn, but it's too late, and she plows right into the family, and John and Peter's sister are killed. Eight years later, we are introduced to the very over-the-top aforementioned Aunt Martha. She calls down Richard and Angela, cooing over her special little girl. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened to Peter? Well, that's kind of the whole point. We don't really know what's going on here yet, except that this lady is straight up cuckoo pants. Any chips? Why, of course. I believe there's a whole bag. 
I'm almost sure of it. The kids are off to camp, and Martha tasked Richard to look after Angela. Her staring past them in a daze. Well, get used to that look. Busloads of children descend upon Camp Arawak, seeing the cigar-chomping camp director Mel amongst them. Also amongst the top-notch camp crew is the disgusting chef, oogling the children and saying that it makes his mouth water. Woo, yeah. Pretty disgusting, dude. Rich reunites with his old buddy, Paul, explaining that Angela doesn't talk too much on account of being shy. There's more news to share, indicating that his former flame, Judy, has had some impressive developments since last summer. Well, we Angela doesn't get much welcome from the other girls, with Judy and Meg bullying her right off the bat for being weird. Noticing that she's still not talking and hasn't eaten, Mr. Muscles, Ronnie, takes her to the kitchen to find something she'd like. The chef is a class act as usual, acting all lecherous and gross, just as he starts undoing his belt, calling her a sweet little cupcake, Ricky shows up to save the day, followed by Mel and others. He asks Artie to check on the giant boiling pot of corn, even needing a chair to reach the top. Woo-wee, that is a lot of corn. A shaky POV sneaks up from behind and shoves Artie, who catches himself before tumbling into the pot. He asks his attacker for some help, and they instead tug the chair away. His fingernails are hanging on, but Artie is losing his grip. They pull the chair once more, spilling the boiling boiling water all over him, burning him horrifically. Well, kind of deserve that, I guess, weirdo. The authorities show up, and a completely bandaged Artie is wheeled away. Mel sees the whole thing as just one big accident, and wants to sweep it all under the rug. No need to upset the campers, right? As for the kitchen staff, he gives Ben the job of head chef, and greases the others with some extra cash to keep their trap shut. The boys are up to some hijinks, tricking another kid into doing a sit-up right into another's butt crack. Oh, <laughs> good one, boys. They get suited up for a apparently important game that their counselor stresses they better not lose. Also, I mean, come on, look at that outfit. You gotta be real confident to pull that off, or just be alive in the 80s, I guess. The crop top plus cut jeans into shorts? Woo! Doesn't get more 80s than that. Rick gets into it with another kid, Bill. He tells Rick to eat shit and die, to which Ricky replies with the absolute banger, eat shit and live, Bill. Eat shit and die, Ricky! Eat shit and live, Bill. What does that even mean? I don't know, but it's amazing. Later in the lounge, the older boys are discussing all the girls, and the conversation turns to awkward Angela. They've been watching her the whole time, and the conclusion is that she is definitely messed up, in their professional opinion. The other day, hairdo to ask her out, and I mean he has no reason not to, unless he's chicken right. This insult spurns him into action, and he invites Angela down to the lake for a midnight swim. They continue berating her until Ricky and his boys show up rolling deep, and he breaks up the fight. The others dogpile on, and Angela watches watches the whole thing silent and stone-faced. Is there anything going on behind those eyes? I'm not sure. Paul least extends an olive branch of friendship. He's heard all about, or at least most of Angela's history, and apologizes for what happened to her family. As for him and Ricky, they go way back three whole years, and he fills her in on the many pranks gone awry they've done since they've met. So many memories. The love connection is put on hold for now when the counselor orders them back to their cabins. Other kids aren't adhering to the lights out, all going skinny dipping down in the water. Leslie and Kenny take a boat out and he puts her on edge with tales about snakes in the water. He tips the boat all the way over, and his date calls him a bastard for his actions. Yeah, going real well with her. He dips under the boat, calling for Leslie, but she's already swam back to land. The killer then pops in, Kenny confusingly wondering what they're doing here. The killer doesn't reply, grabbing his head and dunking it under the water. The guys go to leave and are confident that Kenny is fine, leaving him to fend for himself. In the morning, an ornery lifeguard cleans up the chairs all in disarray, mumbling everyone responsible are peckerheads. He goes to turn over the boat, finding Kenny's body, and a snake squiggles out, just like he said. Woo! The cops show up again and assume that he must have drowned accidentally. I mean, there's no signs of bumps or bruises, you know? Mel agrees with this assessment and still wants to keep things buried. Ronnie pipes up that he isn't so sure about that. Kenny was a good swimmer. This all seems so strange. The girls are out playing volleyball, including Judy wearing a shirt bearing her name. Well, tells you all you need to know about her. Paul sits down next to the outcast and Angela, and she finally speaks. She's doing okay. All right, good to know. He invites her to the rec hall later, clarifying that he means for them to go together. The point being is that she is starting to feel comfortable around Paul, unlike all the others. The blossoming connection draws Judy and Meg's ire once more. Why can she talk to boys while she has to play volleyball? It's totally unfair, y'all. Meg agrees that it's not fair and sends Paul on his way. She turns to Angela. What does she want to do? But Angela says she's just fine watching the game. The two lovebirds meet up that night, seeing them holding hands after the movie. He has to walk her back to her cabin and plants a surprise 
surprise kiss on her. He hopes he's not mad and asks for another peck. Obviously uncomfortable, Angela stomps off to her cabin. Judy then appears, sneering that she didn't realize he and Angela were such an item. Yeah, whatever, Judy. The rest of the boys are busy torturing Mozart as usual. Well, what are you going to do with that name? Setting him up for the old shaving cream in the hand trick. It goes off without a hitch to the boy's delight until he pulls out a knife threatening to kill them and chases them around the room. Jeez, Mozart got hardcore pretty quick there. Counselor Jean comes in and breaks up the fight, wondering if they're all nuts or what. Paul surprises Angela down by the water, and it's soon spoiled by Judy showing up. Well, well, if it isn't the two lovebirds, she cackles. Meg then confronts Angela about not going in the water. Can she not swim or what? She shakes the girl, demanding an answer and Ronnie muscles in. Thanks to this, Meg gets in trouble and thusly blames Angela for what happened. She argues that she didn't actually do anything and they both smirk in curiosity, wondering why doesn't she shower with the other girls? Is she queer or something? Judy Chortle, she must not have had her period yet and launches into another classic one-liner regarding Angela. She's a carpenter's dream, flat as a board and in need of a screw. She's a real carpenter's dream. Needs a hmm, clever. The older boys are having a balloon fight, and one, Bill, launches one right at Angela. Ricky appears to defend his cousin as usual, and he explodes on them until Mel pulls him away. The boys are all punished, not just for the potentially dangerous water balloons, but for Ricky's ever-present dirty mouth. Seriously, kid curses like a sailor. Aunt Martha would not be pleased. It's the balloon launcher Bill that gets the killer's wrath next. He settles in for a luxurious dump, and someone blocks the door with a broom. They then tear open the window screen and drop a hornet's nest right onto his face, stinging him to death. You. With an even more inexplicable death on his hands, Mel is finally starting to see that his lucrative camp business may be coming to an unceremonious end. Who would want to send their kids here after all this? Out of the woods, Angela is wandering around. We see the same shaky POV stalking her. And it's Paul who startles her with a hand on the shoulder. Gotcha! Angela gasps that she thought he was the killer, and he tells her to come down by the lake before they get murdered too. They share a nice moment, playfully chasing each other down on the beach. Things get a little steamy, and Paul goes for a move. She shuts him down, looking frightened, and her mind is shot back to the past. Her dad and his boyfriend Larry are in bed, the kids looking on, giggling from the door. The pair are then in bed, and we keep spinning around them, and at some point along the way, the boy became a girl? Confronted with his history, Angela freaks and runs off, clearly unable to deal with what happened. A game of capture the flag only further complicates things. Paul tries to approach Angela, about the previous night, and she admits that she's just not ready. She pulls away again, and Paul is confused by what her deal is, and she runs off in a huff. Guess who immediately shows up to throw salt in the wound? Judy, smirking to just let her go. Rick shows up and needs her help with his big strategy in the game. He needs to use her as bait while he captures the flag. Solid plan? She doesn't want to play, and he's adamant that he needs her. We can just win, and the game will quickly be over. Come on. She caves to play along and goes where he instructs her. Along the way, she happens upon Judy and Paul making out. They spot Angela, and obviously guilty, Paul chases after. Rick is pissed at Judy too, and when left on her own, Judy cries. Showing a layer of emotion I really didn't think she had in her. The whole thing of her personality is just insecurity, obviously. And by the way, that is the hordest side ponytail of all time. No contest. Down at the swimming hole, Paul feebly attempts to apologize, and lays the blame on Judy for not leaving him alone. Oh, that's kind of true. She then pops up to stir the pot again, really proving the point. And demands to get her in the water once and for all. Normally, Ricky would show up to get her out of a jam, but a crazed Mel believes that he's actually the mysterious murderer. He spits that he did it to destroy him, and Angela is tossed into the traumatic tides by Meg. The lifeguard dives in to save her, also calling Meg a peckerhead. The other kids are less than sympathetic, kicking up dirt at Angela and Ricky on their way back in. Jeez. These kids are awful. That night, the counselors divvy up duties. And Meg gets the night off, leading her right into Mel's musty bedsheets for some reason, making plans for her later that night. Ugh, why would you want to... Ugh, I can only imagine what that guy smells like. Cigars and depression. Getting ready for her big day, Meg is forced to wait in a long line for the shower, and she seeks out refuge in another abandoned water closet. Excited for the night, she sings to herself, and gets stabbed out of nowhere from behind. The killer pulls back the curtain, washing off the blood, and turns off the water. Out in the woods, another counselor leads his troop out on an overnight sleep trip. Sounds fun, right? With the missing people and the murders and the killer on the loose, let's go camping. Paul bumps into Angela and tries to really genuinely apologize to her. As usual, Judy 
rebounds through with another guy, sneering that they make a lovely couple. She really is just always around them, I guess. Nothing else going on in Judy's world, apparently. Angela appears to make up with Paul, telling him to meet her at the waterfront after the social. In the woods, some of the kids are having trouble sleeping, and after pleading please in unison, the counselor caves to their demands. He scoots some of the kids back in the car, while also leaving a few sleeping ones behind, totally helpless. The POV comes to loom over their innocent sleeping faces, and they find a hatchet. The killer ready to take out some little kids. The extra busy this evening killer next turns to the always problematic Judy. She's busy making out with some random dude complaining of his sloppy wet kisses, and they're interrupted by approaching footsteps. It's just Mel in search of Meg, and he then unfortunately discovers her bloody corpse. He's even more convinced for some reason Ricky is responsible, and vows that he will not let him get away with us. Judy is curling her hair, and someone else enters. She thinks it's Ricky at first, and then recognizes them. Oh, it's you? What do you want? The killer punches her out and goes for her hair curler. The killer places a pillow over her face, seeing everything in shadow. A hand reaches up, clutching the curler, and goes right for... Uh, yeah, that's not fun. As if it's not clear, the killer is completely unhinged. Eddie returns to his pack, finding the entire group of kids has been killed in their sleep. Yeesh, really ramping it up. Back at camp, things become quickly chaotic when news of the murder spread, and the counselors split into teams to find the missing kids. Mel surprises Ricky and confronts him about the murders. He pounds on the boy, calling him a liar. He's overtaken by something and realizes he's got to get out of there. He stumbles on to an archery range, and the killer is there waiting. He seems to recognize him as well, croaking that it can't be you. An arrow is unleashed, going right through his throat. Hmm, good shot though. Paul is waiting impatiently down by the waterfront for Angela's arrival. She appears and asks him to come swimming. Well, what about our clothes? Well, take them off, of course, which Paul is totally cool with. A cop with the worst fake mustache ever discovers a beaten but alive Ricky. Ronnie and Susie out in the woods hear singing nearby. They come to Angela with Paul's head in her lap, and she keeps humming. We're then thrown back into the past where the full truth is finally revealed. After the accident, Aunt Martha took Peter in, but she didn't want another boy. So she dressed Peter up like a girl and started calling them Angela. It's such a lovely name, Martha Coos. Angela stands up, now mouth agape and snarling, revealing that Peter still has their uh, original hardware and one of the most memorable ending images in horror. I'm sure back in 83, people lost their minds at the reveal. And nowadays, you know, it's a little obvious where things are heading. Still memorable though, you know, that's the whole point. Of course, the ending itself is what the movie is arguably best known for, but it also does take on new layers of inspection by modern standards. It could be seen as a problematic portrayal of a trans person, but in this case, it's a bit more convoluted than that, because Peter, now Angela, was actually forced by Martha to dress up and pretend to be a girl. So technically, it's not the killer trans trope, but rather the unresolved trauma that Peter suffers that caused them to snap more than their gender really having anything to do with it. Following the release of Sleepaway Camp, it seems to have at least initially kind of quickly fallen out of the limelight. Robert Hiltzik, the de facto creator, even sold his rights to Double Helix Films. I guess the takeaway is really that the first one just wasn't that successful, and I can see how it would be hard to figure out what to do in a sequel. I mean, Angela has to be the killer, right? The sequel takes a vastly different approach to the original, with a much more over-the-top, tongue-in-cheek feel, a stark contrast to the naturalistic sort of first century. Now it's a much more straightforward affair, with the now moralistic killer Angela taking out a whole new batch of campers. It is definitely a typical dead kid slasher of his time, that's for sure. Even the moral killer angle, she targets kids up to no good, sex, drugs, and all that good stuff, just like Jason. It's pretty obvious what they're going for here, but I can't help but really love Sleepaway Camp 2. The cheesiness is actually welcome in my book, leading to some classic one-liners and a lot of great special effects gore provided by Bill Splat Johnson. Whoa, great appropriate nickname for old Billy Boy. And in fact, I'd say that this is my personal favorite of the series. There's a lot to love about its particular take on a kind of meta teen slasher of the late 80s. It also amusingly features none other than Bruce Springsteen's sister Pamela starring as Angela in both this entry and part three. The character Angela is also quite different than before by design, and Pamela really does give a memorable performance, tossing out murderous quits with ease. Also, speaking of famous siblings, this features Renee Estevez, sister to Emilio, as our goody two-shoes heroine Molly. The story picks up five years after the original massacre, and Camp Arawak has been rebranded to Camp Rolling Hills. They're all set for a new start, yet there's a wrinkle, as Angela, who was forced to have a sex change while in psychiatric care, from which she escaped, has taken a new role at the camp as a counselor. Although no one knows that she is THE Angela, word of the killings has become legendary in the area. Around the campfire,
Fire Phoebe tells the group about the earlier killings with some fear and disbelief amongst the audience. Angela quickly nips this in the bud, ordering Phoebe back to the cabin. As punishment for her naughty tongue spreading rumors about her, Angela bonks her with a log and cuts out her tongue. This leads right into the opening titles and one seriously kick-ass theme song. Might be the best part of the whole movie. It all really kicks us off on an exciting note and lets us know just what kind of experience we were in for this time. Lots of murder and jokes. Once camp is in session, Angela acts as a voice of morality for all the naughty kids at camp, taking them out one by one for their sins. And every time she fibs to the warm-hearted Uncle John, she had to send them home. After a while, you're like, how many kids are even left at the camp at this point? But as far as what everyone else sees, Angela is a sincere square that really cares about camp and the kids. This is probably best scene during a breakfast in the mess hall. Angela is just so excited and has to lead the entire group in a rousing rendition of her favorite song, I'm a Happy Camper. Oh, I'm a happy camper. Oh, I'm a happy camper. I love the clear blue sky. Amongst the naughty kids she dispatched, perhaps my favorite of the bunch are the marijuana toking short or shit sisters, as the other kids call them. Angela catches them smoking and giggling like a bunch of fools and knocks them uncomfortable. Conscious. One sister comes to perched on a large barbecue, coming face to face with her creepy skeleton sis. Angela tosses a match, reminding her that drugs are bad and sets her ablaze. Hmm, pretty good. She remains undetected, but her demeanor draws the scorn of the other kids. Two pranksters dress as Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees in order to scare Angela. Of course, they don't know the real Angela, and she one-ups them with her own surprise iconic costume. A combination of Michael Myers and Leatherface. She takes them out with devilish glee, slashing Anthony's throat and unleashing her chainsaw upon Judd. Her story eventually starts falling apart when Angela is fired for just too many of the kids mysteriously going home. Other kids wander to a vacant cabin in the woods Angela has been hanging out at and discover that's where she's been housing all of her bodies. She silences them as well, especially as Sean figures out her true identity. Molly is able to escape her clutches and Angela disposes of all the other survivors. She leaves the camp to hitch a ride and before too long takes out the foul driver. Sometime later, Molly comes to and makes it to a road. Seeing a truck approaching, she hops in and of course it's Angela driving, implying that she didn't make it out after all. Nah, too bad. Unhappy Campers was quickly followed up with Teenage Wasteland, which released a mere one year later, including the return of the same creative team, director Michael Simpson, writer Fritz Gordon, and star Pamela Springsteen. Now you think they might have had issues with that super tight turnaround, but the filmmakers do manage to make this one feel quite different, despite it being the same basic camp killer setup. First of all, we open in the big city, a first sight for the series. Following teen Maria, she's off to summer camp, but unfortunately for her, she won't be making her bus. While out in the mean streets, a semi appears out of nowhere and chases her down. It's Angela, up to her old tricks, and she stuffs Maria's body into the compactor, promptly taking over her identity. Unsurprisingly, Arawak has been given another fresh coat of paint to hopefully cover up the increasing pile of murders on the property. This time, it's known as New Horizons. And the eccentric new owners, Herman and Lily are staging a social experiment for some reason. Not sure where that inspiration is. The campers this time are a mix of surly inner city youths along with out of touch upper class dinguses. Angela blends in taking Maria's place and things turn out how you might expect. As far as, you know, murdering more people that she considers bad, the rich versus poor angle does spice things up a bit character wise with an interesting look at multicultural and class divisions of its era, which also gives us some very broad and entertaining characters. Probably at the top of the heap is the one and only Riff. He always has a boombox in every single scene and all also includes an extra serving of attitude on the side. He's ridiculous, but still really funny. You hurt me the first time! What? There's a star-crossed lover story in there too. What a Richie falls for a poor person. Oh, see, we all aren't that different after all, don't you know? Even if it is the same basic setup of Angela taking out another crew of naughty nubiles, it does feel quite different from his predecessors. Namely, Angela herself takes on new shades of her personality, and many times doing her best to not draw attention outside of her killings. This time, she also seems a bit more downtrodden compared to her gleeful violence of unhappy campers. Early on, she picks up an axe and groans to the camera 
Sandra, I don't know why I thought this year would be any different. She feels a real obligation to her Angel of Death moniker at this point, as though her actions are actually for the greater good, not just to kill for funsies, you know. The many stereotypes that repeatedly prove themselves don't exactly detract from her case, and there's soon another bloodbath on the hands of Camp New Horizons. This time the whole camp actually goes out camping for a change, splitting into several groups, and Angela slims their numbers in her typical fashion. The only one that even comes close to undoing her is Officer Barney, who we learn is the father of a victim of Angela's first massacre. Our final girl this time, Marsha, stumbles across a victim's body, and Barney urges her to run. After a tense standoff, Angela blows Barney away. Eh, there's so much for that. Angela then rounds up whoever is left and takes them hostage, and sets up a demented game, ordering them to find Marsha's location. In the end, Angela does decide to let Marsha and Tony go, and on the way out, Marsha stabs the absolute shit out of Angela. They call the police, and Angela is whisked away in an ambulance. She regains consciousness and quickly attacks everyone with a syringe. The confused driver asks what's going on, and she sneers, just taking care of business. When it comes to Sleepaway Camp 4, there were a few attempts to get a new sequel going, which began back in 89, right after Teenage Wasteland. Michael Simpson was set to return with quite a humdinger of a concept that I recently even learned about. Called Summerstock, Camp Arawak has been rebranded as a dinner theater setup. The theater is mounting a production of Angela's life story, and Angela, played by Felissa Rose this time, auditions to play herself. As the audience, we're made to not be sure if it really is Angela, who is now believed to be dead. A religious cult was also involved, who were trying to stop the play from happening, feeling that it was disrespectful to Angela's memory. Then the killing starts again, and we wonder if it's a cult, or is Angela truly back? Well, seems like she was. There was a kind of twist on Angela as a character as well that I think is really cool. She's been in and out of mental hospitals for years and has thusly lost touch with reality. She really thinks that she's Angela, but maybe that isn't the case. The intention here was to make her a more sympathetic character, and they even considered having zombie-like dead characters from the first three movies popping up and doing full-on musical numbers. What the heck? The play would also lean into a long-held fan theory regarding there being actually two different Angelas, namely again that two different women had been her at different times. They were going to really lean into this idea by even having Pamela's Angela show up at the climax and having a bloody showdown between her and Felissa's Angela. That actually would have been amazing. And it's way more clever than any of the other sequels that we got. Alas, it wasn't meant to be. And Summerstock never got past the idea stage. However, a few years later in 1992, production started on part four of the series, Sleepaway Camp The Survivor. It was the same company, Double Helix, that produced two and three, yet it had an entirely new cast and creative crew. Based on a treatment, they filmed a trailer in upstate New York with the intention of using the trailer to raise money for the full movie. Unfortunately, before they got too far into shooting, Double Helix went bankrupt, and the footage was thought to be lost forever. That may have been the case, if not for the efforts of superfan John Kleiza, creator of SleepawayCampFilms.com, who spent 10 years trying to confirm that any footage has survived. Indeed, buried in the production company's vault, John hit the motherload of some raw footage from the survivor. Anchor Bay, a big boutique label at the time, released a special edition of the series, the Sleepaway Camp Survival Kit, exclusively available at Best Buy. This is the only way the footage was officially released, and of course, the set is long out of print. You can find it on eBay for not that much, though. The bonus footage is interesting for super fans, but it doesn't really offer much insight into the movie. It really is completely raw, unedited takes from random scenes, totaling about 30 minutes. While the movie never will be fully completed, a version was cobbled together using the production footage and copious flashbacks from the previous three films. This was the original idea of Survivor, to heavily feature scenes from the first three films and act as a kind of culmination of the trilogy. As this time, we follow the perspective of Allison, a survivor of a previous attack of Angela's, who now suffers from memory loss. She doesn't remember who she truly is. Through therapy sessions, she's forced to confront the past, leading to copious flashbacks from the previous films. Perhaps unsurprisingly in the end, Allison does finally remember her true identity, and she's the angel of death Angela herself. Now that she remembers, everyone gets taken out in classic Angela style. I guess we will always have to just be curious how this one would have turned out if it didn't get canceled. Since Survivor was never technically completed, the series is considered pretty much done with Teenage Wasteland. It wasn't until many years later that word spread of Robert returning to hopefully recapture the spirit of the original in some way. Then came more concerning delays. Return to Sleepaway Camp was filmed in 2003 and scheduled to be released by 2006, but due to Hillstick being unsatisfied with the CG as well as a lack of distribution deals, it took until 2009 for it to finally 
finally be released. I'm sure all that extra time and CG tinkering really paid off, right? No such luck as Return to Sleepaway Camp is easily the worst of the entire series. There's really nothing that works here, and what amounts to a shoddy sort of retread of the first movie's plot. I kept going, this costs four million dollars? You can't tell. There are also lots of overt references to the original, and you're going, is that an easter egg or just laziness? For some reason, we mostly follow this smelly annoying kid Alan, and I really do not understand why this guy is a protagonist. It's not all Alan's fault either, the whole thing is just a mess. From the very opening credits, packed full of crummy even at the time After Effects, along with some shitty 311 some 41 knockoff, I'm already like, Ugh. Then we start getting into the heavy hitters in the cast, such as Vincent Pastor, you know, big pussy on The Sopranos, and Isaac Hayes, playing what else? The chef. Literally the first scene is a bunch of boys lighting their own farts, creating some pretty serious flames there. Jeez, what are these kids eating? Then Alan storms in and tries his hand at making fart flames. His is much smaller, and Alan gets agitated, creating a flamethrower with hairspray. His counselor Randy intervenes, calling him stupid, and Alan runs off into the night, shouting after that his ass stinks. Wow, you know, Know, what an opening. Also worth mentioning that telling someone their ass stinks is kind of like Alan's catchphrase. Your ass stinks. Really? Your ass stinks. Because I seriously lost count of the number of times the same basic setup happens and it ends with him leaving telling them their ass stinks. Another series of killings begin in a fairly familiar manner. An offended Alan is sent back to the kitchen by Ronnie, one of our few returning characters. Unlike Angela who was graciously offered ice cream, Mickey isn't having it. He scares the boy off and sometime later the killer appears and pushes him over into the deep fryer. Mickey hangs on as long as he can but inevitably falls face first into the piping hot grease. An almost exact recreation of the killing in the first movie. The intent many times is to lead us to believe that Alan is the latest camp killer and as more of those that wronged him wind up dead, it's not helping his case. The only one that suspects otherwise is Ronnie, believing the killings are somehow connected to the murders from decades prior. He teams up with the more than suspicious looking Sheriff Jerry to tackle the case. Yep, nothing unusual about Sheriff Jerry's appearance whatsoever. Honestly, that is some of the worst disguise makeup I've ever seen. It's not even close to being realistic, yet no one ever questions it. That's certainly strange. I wonder why that is. They're led to another familiar face, Cousin Ricky. According to him, Angela is still locked up in a psychiatric hospital. He does go to visit her on occasion, but he's the only one that does so. Thanks, good to see you, Ricky. There's a few fairly decent kills along the way, but one definitely stands out for its sheer insanity alone. One counselor, Randy, along with his lady, go to the pump house to, you know, well, Pump, which he makes several references to in case you weren't absolutely certain what he was referring to. Oh no. This is why they call it the pump house. <laughs> the stage is set for romance, and Randy goes to rock a piss. The killer then throws rope around him, binding him to the tree, and then unleashes a smaller fishing wire that dangles perilously lower down his body. Yep, it goes around his junk. Linda freaks out when seeing the situation and bolts to the Jeep. She proceeds to drive off, not realizing that the dick line is attached to the Jeep. He's given a brief reprieve when she gets stuck in a ditch, but luckily remembers she has four-wheel drive. She kicks it into gear, yanking his hog right off. She doesn't fare much better, also encountering another wire trap in the road that painfully tears into her face. Yeah, again, I was like, what the hell was going on there? The whole thing is just weird. Eventually, the camp becomes completely convinced Alan is a killer, at least until finding him badly injured in the woods, just like Ricky. None other than the confusing in appearance, Sheriff Jerry steps out, squawking through their voice box about how all these pesky kids will never learn. According to them, they all got what they deserved. Uh-oh, that sure sounds familiar. They then remove all the dodgy makeup, revealing that he was Angela all along. Yeah, that was pretty obvious. It is kind of funny that Angela is dressed up as a dude, a kind of weird reversal of the ending of the first film. I'm confused. The others then kind of randomly run around and find another kid dead. Angela starts laughing and turns right to the camera with an evil gaze. The end. There is one last post credit scene that shows us how she took the sheriff's ID. Apparently, after escaping the psychiatric facility, she fakes a roadside emergency. Pete shows up to lend a hand, and she kicks the jack, plopping the car down on his head. Not sure how she got that fancy makeup figured out, but yeah, either way, not the most convincing mimicry. And well, that's the conclusion of the entire series. Going out with more of a whimper after so many years. I also find the whole Sheriff Jerry twist completely bizarre. Presumably it was actually Felissa Rose playing him throughout the scenes, and her coming back to the series is a big deal, especially to fans. She was only in the first one after all, so it's just really bizarre to basically hide her in plain sight the whole time, and then have the big reveal of her at the end. Maybe it was to set up a sequel or something. Oh, you know, Angela is really back now or something. But as we know, that never came to fruition, and this is where the series limps to a conclusion. 
Kind of a bummer, really, because it feels like the series had more potential than what it ultimately became. At least we have the all-time classic original, and it seems that perhaps the real problem is that it was impossible to really recreate what made the first one so special. I don't know, maybe not all horror movies should be sequelized. Sometimes it can just be its own thing, you know? That's not in the 80s, though. That was against the law, basically. I was considering as I was making this video, what would I say is the legacy of the Sleepaway Camp series? No doubt the first film will always be considered a classic of the slasher-dominated 80s, but I think what is interesting is the biggest impression the series left is Angela herself. Even more specifically, Felissa Rose's performance in the first film. Felissa instantly became a huge genre star with her debut role at the mere age of 13. Over the decades, Felissa has been a convention staple, almost always copying the infamous face from the ending. And really, she has become not only synonymous with the series, but perhaps even more popular than the series itself. So perhaps it's really Angela and Felissa that have left the biggest impact of the series as a whole. I could see a remake of the original come out at some point, and I'm genuinely surprised the many attempts to do so never got off the ground either. So for now, that is a definitive end of the Sleepaway Camp series. What did you think of Sleepaway Camp and its ending? Which is your favorite of the series? Let me know down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.